Stop the FOMO. Do you have a fear of missing out on the Samsung QN98, otherwise known as Samsung's best darkroom performing TV, not just for 2021, but possibly ever? Well, that's what we're focused on today. Today's video is to review the QN98's darkroom performance. We're focusing on its deep blacks, shadow detail, blooming if any, lifted blacks issues, all the stuff that affect darkroom performance, all the things that make the OLED king of darkroom TV watching. So let's talk about what happens when Samsung turns off the lights in 2021. So today's video focuses on QLED's biggest weakness, its darkroom performance. And in this case, the QN90A, how does it perform in a dark room compared to last year and compared to all other QLEDs or non-OLED TVs in general? And I just want to jump in there and say, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let me introduce today's sponsor, WhoKeys. Yep, you just finished your big old PC Windows build. You have the best of the best. And sadly, you have less than $20 to your name. WhoKeys to the rescue. Use my code SF20 and immediate discount. Within minutes, you can download the Windows 10 Pro key and you're up and running. But that's not all, folks. WhoKeys has keys for games too. Steam, Origin, Uplay, you name it, you got it. Check out their sites. There are discounts for all sorts of stuff. And most importantly, you want to be productive? What about Office Suite? Yep, you can download a copy of Office Professional with my code SF20 at checkout and bam, under $40. What's not to love? The Q900TS was a bit of a disappointment last year in terms of its darkroom performance as it pertains to deep blacks and blooming control, but its shadow detail is very good. And let me tell you, the Q90A takes what was great about the Q900TS, raises that game, and addresses every shortcoming I had on the Q900TS. And my mind is blown because, well, the Q900TS was $5,500 last year. This year, this TV is $2,600. What does it do differently? What's happening? And I want to go over my notes. Then we'll jump into some sample footages. And at the end, closing thoughts, a possible competition for 2021, how it compares to the OLED use case, and whether it's worth your $2,600 MSRP. So the notes. The dimming algorithm is clearly improved. <laughs> when I say it's improved, I don't even think it's the mini LED. I can see the algorithm working. And I'll show you guys in the footage. But... Definitely, it is faster and it's more accurate, jumping from bright scenes to dark scenes and back again much more effectively. Next is it has better and faster light adjustment. In other words, when we're talking about going from bright scenes to dark scenes, you see in the Nahru TS, which was last year's most advanced blooming algorithm, it doesn't compare to this year's QN98. This year's, it just... It just moves smoother. So for example, I have this white box. It's bright. And as the white box shrinks, on the Nahru TS, you're going to see it kind of jerking in, 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 right? Segmenting in, in as the box gets smaller. But on the Q90A, it gradually shrinks with the size of the box in a way that's much more natural. And that's hard to do. They did it this year. Additionally, Starfield performance, they raised the game. So the Nahru TS was very good at focusing on bringing out some of that Starfield performance without the flashing that some QLEDs had before. And its issue, though, was a little bit of black crushing. So the Q90A solves the black crushing on the Starfield. That can be said of the Nahru TS. Nahru TS, instead of bringing out the stars, they were afraid it would bloom, so they crushed it. Q98, because of its improved dimming zone algorithm, is not afraid of the blooming because there is very little blooming. Now, there is some blooming. Obviously, if they eliminate it completely, it'd be an OLED, right? But you'll see for yourself. I'll have the Starfield examples, and you can see, oh, wow, wow, yeah, this has improved. Next is brightness at max 50. So this is the part that I find they really improved. Set to max 50 brightness, the QN90A. The black level in the middle of a specular highlight, we have this bright scene, very bright, 
and in the middle is deep black. That black is retained better than a 900TS, and the H9G couldn't do that, right? The H9G did the opposite well. Bright in black, it did well. But here we have bright, black within bright, only an OLED could do that perfectly. Well, this QLED comes so close, and you'll see for yourself how close it gets. It does it better than the 900TS, and that was the strength of the 900TS last year. You'll see some comparisons in real scenes. We're using the greatest showman for this, and you'll really enjoy seeing how well the q 98 did in that scene. Cleanest black bars yet. So last year's 900TS, the black bars are okay. You know, typical for a QLED. This year, pitch black. And this was my exposure, pumped way up to see if there was any light leakage, none at all. In the 900TS, you can see a little bit of light leakage and I had to pump up to 16,000 ISO for you to see that. But on the 90A, the QN 90A, even at 16,000 ISO, black. That is OLED level, folks. I'm impressed. Next up, okay, so this is the controversial part. Many reviewers, some people are saying, well, you know, straight up it looks great, but then off angle, you're gonna get blooming. Not the case. You're getting blooming regardless of whether it's a mini LED or not mini LED, right? What we're talking about is off angle, does it get worse? Well, up to 30 degrees, barely. Barely noticeable that it was any worse and more importantly, better than the 900TS. So the 900TS and the Q90A, see for yourself how the blooming differences are because only the footage can tell the story. But I can tell you upfront right now, if you are worried about off-axis viewing and your off-axis is within 30 degrees, don't worry about it. Now, as you extend outside of 30 degrees, maybe the blooming may get a little worse and I'm gonna have to explore that separately because reasonably speaking, I don't think people are sitting off more than 30, 35 degrees. And in that case, this TV is fine. It's no worse off at 35 degrees off axis, specifically that blooming issue that some are afraid of. So, oh, and a reminder, this is a 65 inch TV. So that's something to keep in mind. Many reviews are out there with different size TVs. I'm reviewing the 65 inch QN90A. It does have more dimming zones. It has 792 dimming zones versus the 55 inch with I think 576 dimming zones or something like that, the, five, five, the high 500s. That's a little over 10 dimming zones per inch if you're taking the diagonal. And the QN90A at 65 inches has a little over 12 dimming zones per diagonal inch. That's not a huge difference. So I would be surprised if the 65 inch is that much better than the 55, but I just have to emphasize that I am reviewing the 65 inch TV. So if there are any differences in the 55, how much that is due to the size, I don't know, but I have to mention that. So let's jump into the actual footage. We are going to look at the Spears and Munsell's UHD benchmark disc to compare some of those scenes and Starfield, of course. Then we're going to use the, the movie, The Greatest Showman, so you can see that there are certain scenes where you have really dark and really bright in the same scene. That's a great way to see when you pump up the brightness, is there lifted blacks? And at the end, we're gonna wrap up and you tell me what you think about the QN90A. So let's get into those scenes. Let's start by introducing the TVs. The top TV is the Samsung Q900 TS, 2019's flagship 65 inch TV from Samsung. Bottom TV is the QN90A, the 2021 flagship 4K TV. And the test material we are using is the Spears and Munsell UHD Benchmark Disc. Unfortunately, with the camera set to normal exposure, you're not going to see a lot of differences. Also, I have to increase the camera exposure to an ISO of between 16,000 and 64,000 for you to see the differences between these TVs. Now you'll be able to see the processing at work. Watch how the Q900TS above jumps from dimming zone to dimming zone as the box gets larger and larger. And on the QN98, look at how sharp the edge of the box is on all four sides. This is exactly the sort of improvement I expect going from 480 dimming zones last year to almost 800 dimming zones this year. 
Now let's take a close look at the dimming zone performance of the QN90A below. Definitely less blooming against a slightly darker screen. But enough test patterns, let's look at real HDR content you're likely to see. This is also from the Spears & Munsell disc. Both look good, but let's increase the exposure to see the differences. Right there, we begin to see significantly more blooming on the Q900TS than the QN90A. But at normal viewing exposure in the dark, these differences are not as drastic as it appears. But even here, you notice the improved contrast ratio of the QN90A. Let's take it up another notch with the Starfield test. Significantly less black crushing on the QN90A, no doubt. Look at those bright stars compared to what you see from the Q900TS. And yes, both TVs are set to max brightness 50 and dimming zone set to high. But let's try it again by moving the TV off angle by about 30 to 35 degrees. And let's turn up the exposure to get a clearer picture of what's happening. By the way, this level of blooming is the same whether directly on axis or off axis by about 30 degrees. And right there, we see blooming by the Q900TS. And of course, not all is perfect with the QN90A. There is a touch of blooming here. If not for this, we can actually call this an OLED beater, right? But on the Q900TS, this is bad. I never saw the QN90A ever get this bad. And I think that's where the improvement in the algorithm really shines. I love what's happening here because it shows that when the Q900TS tries to put out the same number of stars as the QN90A like here, what happens? Pretty bad blooming. And that's why they err on the side of crushing those stars just a little bit to avoid this issue. Keeping the TV off axis by about 30 to 35 degrees, let's try this scene from Spears and Munsell disc. I did slow this scene down to a quarter speed so you can enjoy HDR in all its glory. This is my favorite test for black room performance, blooming, deep blacks, and all that good stuff. Obviously looking good in normal exposure, but let's turn it up a notch and dive into the differences. For the TV nerds and all of us, this is dimming zone peeping, my version of pixel peeping. This is definitely one scene where I believe the Q900TS is impressive and outperforms the QN90A. There are many instances where you see the QN90A has a touch more blooming. Obviously, if this was sped up, you would not notice this, but I had to slow it down just to see how good this processing could be when fully challenged. But this is off angle. Let's shift it on angle, off angle, back and forth so you can see for yourself if there is any change in blooming performance. For this exercise, we're gonna use another favorite scene from the Spears and Muscle disc, the Ferris wheel. This is an excellent test of dimming zone control between the spokes of the Ferris wheel. Clearly way less blooming between the spokes, but is it possible that the Q900TS on top is actually brighter even though both are set to max brightness? Correct, the 900TS on top is actually brighter even though the QN90 is set to max 50, it cannot get as bright on this scene, but this is why it's improved. Samsung realized that if they set it too bright for peak brightness and highlights, what happened? You risk blooming like above on the 900TS. And in normal lighting conditions, you take it down a little, you see that, well, it does look a touch brighter, but you're also losing a little bit of color volume. We'll get into that in another video. Clearly, the QN90A is a mature product. It knows its limits, doesn't push beyond them. But that brings us to the question, are we at the ceiling of what a QLED TV can do in terms of brightness before we risk blooming? And I think we are. Both TVs, although set to their most accurate movie mode, the QN90A at 50 simply doesn't get as bright, which is kind of surprising because I complained last year that the Q900TS peak brightness was not bright enough. Uh-oh. But that's a discussion for another day.
but let's move the TV from about 35 degrees off axis back on axis to see if there's any change and nope. Whether you're direct view or a little bit of off axis is pretty much consistent on both TVs. Now we move on to a real movie, The Greatest Showman. On the QN90A, notice the deeper blacks overall. The black bars above and below are significantly darker on the QN90A, and you've lost a lot of that black detail in the specular highlights on the Q900TS. The QN90A retains much of the black highlights and shadow detail in this very contrasty scene, especially the rays of light coming out from the bottom of that lantern. Wow. That's impressive from the QN90A. But I know what you're saying. This is so unfair. The Q900TS is set to high brightness. Its accurate color mode is actually 34 brightness. Well, let's do that. Let's put it to 34 and then see what happens. And there is no change. Despite the lower 34 brightness, the Q900TS still has slightly lifted blacks compared to the QN90A. And if we blast up the exposure, yep, pretty obvious. Okay, so I was left totally impressed by the QN90A's darkroom performance. And in quick summary, accurate light control definitely improved over last year's flagship 900TS and shadow detail, the strength of the 900TS. This TV's got it. Great shadow detail, better shadow detail than the 900TS. You saw it in The Greatest Showman. I was pretty floored by that because I thought The Greatest Showman and the 900TS was perfect combination. This TV raised the bar a bit more in a dark room. Is it worth $2,600? I have to say absolutely yes in the context of all of Samsung's TV offerings from the Q9FN, then the Q90R, and definitely last year's Q90T. This TV is worth the 2,600 MSRP compared to all those TVs and their pricing at way above 2600 and the 90T was actually more expensive and it just underperformed the QN90A. Today, you have a choice between now it's discounted. The QN90T or the Q90T is around just under 2000 and the QN90A is around 2600. Is it worth an extra five or six hundred dollars? <laughs> The level of improvement is a resounding yes. This is an entire tier higher than the 90T. Now, unlike the LG C10 and C1, where they're very similar because the core technology hasn't changed much. Here, going from the 90T to the QN90A, we're talking going from just over 100 dimming zones to almost 800 dimming zones on the 65-inch size, but on to future competitors for this year. And I'm talking about the Hisense flagship for 2021. Yes, it's coming. It's a 4K TV. It will be priced under $2,000 for certain. The question is whether this TV is worth $2,600 when you have a Hisense coming at under $2,000. That remains to be seen. But for those of you who only trust the mainstream brands, the big three, LG, Samsung, Sony, how does the Samsung compare to the rest? Well, not having seen the LG Q90 yet and not having seen the Sony X95J, but I will bring it in for you to compare. I cannot say for certain that this Samsung Q98 is better than all of them, but compared to itself and the Q90R and the 900TS, this TV is without a doubt an improvement. And at $2,600, its only competitor this year so far is the LG C1, which will be another comparison we'll have later because this video has gone long enough. So please stick around and maybe it'll be here, 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 and here in one of those videos suggested for your viewing pleasure. Until next time, stop the FOMO.